Heavenly Father, we look forward to the day when we will sing your praise forevermore with no more stain, no more shadow of sin, uh, but only a full view of your glory uh, when we will revel in your grace for all of eternity. God, it is only by your grace that we stand. It is only by your initiating love, uh, your effectual calling, and your grace through and through uh, that we could know you that we could have our sins forgiven, uh, that we could be before you even this day and hear from your word. And so we ask for your help by your Holy Spirit, even this morning, uh, to hear from you, uh, to be leveled by grace, to be humbled by your love, to be taken aback in awe all over again at your initiating kindness. For those who do not deserve to know you, to be given such remarkable status as declared righteous, adopted, forgiven, pardoned, loved. We ask for help in these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're continuing this morning our study of the book of Romans, and we're finding ourselves in Romans chapter 9, and we'll be studying together Romans 9, 6 through 13. This, of course, is Paul's argument for the defense of God's Word. Of course, God's Word itself needs no defending, but the situation that Paul found himself in the first century was one that could cast doubt on the integrity of God's promises. Israel as a nation had forsaken, rejected, even killed her Messiah, the Messiah that was promised through her. In spite of all of the promises, in spite of all of the immense privileges, in spite of having the words of God in their own language, in their own safekeeping, Israel had rejected Messiah. What a tragedy this was on a human level, and a potential threat at the divine level for the very integrity of God and those promises. Romans 1 through 8 has been a a mountaintop experience of seeing the promises of God, the benefits of those promises for believers. But if God might break His promises to Israel, then the very integrity of those promises for us are at stake. That is the problem that Paul is seeking to solve in Romans 9 to 11, the problem of Israel's unbelief and what that means for the very Word of God. And so Paul asks the question in Romans 9, 6, it is not as though the Word of God has failed, And he seeks to answer that, that potential threat, in the following three chapters. And just to remind us, the the answer to this question, the Word of God has not failed, comes in three parts. And the first part is what we'll look at this morning. And the answer is simply this, not all Israel is Israel. Not all Israel is Israel. That's what we'll unfold this morning. Uh, That will take us through the majority of chapter 9. There's a second answer to the question, and it is that God keeps a remnant by faith. In other words, those who are of Israel who do believe stand by faith. Uh, That's coming at the end of chapter 9 and in through chapter 10. And then in chapter 11, the whole idea culminates in the reality that God will keep His promises to Israel, all of His promises, in a final repentance and restoration of the nation as a whole. And all three of these answers answer the statement that God's word has not failed. God will keep his promises. In spite of how dark and dire the situation might look in the, in the present day of Paul's writing this letter. Another way to summarize these three answers is chapter 9 is all about salvation by grace. Salvation comes by grace. That is, it comes by God's work, not man's work. And the grace that is on display in Romans chapter 9 is the grace of election. The grace of election. That is, God's initiating work to set His affectionate love on people who don't deserve it. This is a work that God works from beginning to end. It is His work. Uh, This is called the doctrine of election. It is, in fact, a synonym with grace. And chapter 9 is all about God's salvation coming by grace And by grace alone, the grace of election. 
Now, chapter 10 will unfold this even further and tell us that the salvation by grace comes through faith. It really, chapter 9 ends with this theme and, and leads us into chapter 10, whose overwhelming theme is that salvation that is by grace, this electing grace, will come through the human activity called faith. This is a faith that is produced by grace. It is the vehicle by which grace is embraced in the life. And so one way to think about chapter 9 is God's work in salvation and Romans chapter 10 will be our responsibility. And these two things are not mutually exclusive. And then chapter 11 will detail for us the reality that salvation by grace through faith will one day come in full to national ethnic Israel. God will, in fact, keep His promises. Let's read together Romans 9, 6 to 13. Here's the Word of God through the Apostle Paul. But it is not as though the Word of God has failed. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac your descendants will be named." That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. Not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. This passage details for us God's work, God's grace, The reality is God will not be obligated by anything in the creature in order to bestow his love on those who don't deserve it. What God is obligated by, we shall see, is his own purpose, his own glory. God is not obligated by anything in the creature. And the main point of this passage is to simply say this, in order to demonstrate that God's word has not failed in Israel's rejection of Messiah, Paul proves from two Old Testament examples that God has always saved sinners by his own free grace. God has always saved sinners by his own free grace. For God to select some to be saved by his own free choice, by his own selection, the grace of election is nothing new. In fact, for much of Israel to have rejected Messiah is not a threat to the word of God. We looked at this last week. God actually foretold that this very thing would take place. And God can still keep his promises that he made and he can keep them to the letter. Because he chooses whom he will save, whom he will set his affection on. And Paul proves that this is nothing new, that this doctrine of gracious selection over and against what sinners deserve has been the way that God has saved sinners all throughout history. And he appeals to two Old Testament examples to demonstrate this. Paul begins in verse 6 by simply answering the, the threat to the word of God by saying this, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Not all Israel is Israel, says Paul. And there are two uses of the word Israel here in Romans 9.6. The first use of the word Israel is simply national ethnic Israel. And the second use of Israel is a national ethnic Israel, but a subset of that population. A subset of ethnic Israel that is believing Israel. You see, not all Jews are believing Jews. Not all those who are descended of Israel are spiritual Israel. 
And by spiritual Israel, we don't mean some entity that aren't Jews. We simply mean Jews that are spiritual, Jews that have been born again by the Spirit of God, Jews that have the Spirit of God, Jews that are spiritual in nature. To be an Israel of the second type is to be a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to be born of the Spirit. To be of Israel of the first type is simply to be a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And why are those three names important? We understand that the nation of Israel properly begins with one man, the man whose name is Israel. His name, of course, was first Jacob until he wrestled with God, and his name was changed to Israel. Not all of the children of Abraham are considered Jews, right? The Arabs also are descendant from Abraham through Ishmael. Uh, The sons of Keturah also uh, were another set of people. Only those who came through the line of Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob are technically Jews. And only those who are born again by the Spirit of God are spiritual Jews. What Paul is not saying here in Romans 9, 6 is that the real Israel are not Jews at all, but anybody who believes. He's not saying the church is the new Israel or some other sort of replacement. This is a subset population. In fact, all of the examples that he gives to prove this point are all genetic Jews. Nobody in this list to prove that not all Israel is Israel is anything other than an Israelite. The ones selected by grace just happen to be those who are born again by the Spirit. The point of this distinction is that the only way someone ever gets saved, uh, the, way, the only way that anyone ever has a right relationship with God, the only way that anyone ever possesses eternal life is by grace. It's by grace. By the supernatural work of God and His undeserved selection. You remember that the Jews in Jesus' day made claims on their heritage. Look at John 8 for just a moment. In John chapter 8, God Himself is in the midst of His people. Jesus the Christ, God in the flesh, is amongst Jews who have Abraham as their heritage. In verse 39, they claimed this before Jesus. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Abraham is our father. What are they claiming? They're claiming an entitlement by lineage. They're claiming an entitlement to God's favor simply by their physical descent. And Jesus' answer to them is, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you're seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. (laughs) And Jesus goes on to describe to them, they are... Not children of Abraham in a spiritual sense. They are children of Satan in a spiritual sense. In Luke chapter 3, we have the the same thing. The Jews claiming Abraham for their descent. And and the response to them there in Luke 3, 8 is that God can raise up children of Abraham from rocks. (laughs) The point is your physical descent doesn't mean entitlement to God's favor. There was, of course, a subset of the population of Israel that was spiritual. Jesus remarks about Nathanael. He says, look, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. What does Jesus mean by that, an Israelite indeed? I mean, he he was in Israel, and just about everybody around him were Israelites. But Nathanael stood out. Uh, There was an Israelite within Israel. Here was an Israelite indeed. That is a a spiritual one, one awake and alive to the things of God. The Jews were a very, very privileged people. They had the oracles of God, Paul says. 
They had the promises of God. They had the covenants of God. Theirs were the fathers, and from them was the Christ, God overall blessed forever. And yet, as one author says, to regard religious privilege as spiritual reality is the very deadliest delusion. What a horrible thing to have all the rich privileges that the Jews had and to assume that that meant you were okay with God. This was not the case. God's grace is never obligated. God's grace is free. The freedom of God's grace is what the Bible calls election. And so we're looking this morning at two Old Testament examples to prove that this is how God has always secured His people in love. The first example is this. God's gracious selection of Isaac demonstrates that God is not obligated to save on the basis of lineage. God's gracious selection of Isaac demonstrates that God is not obligated to save on the basis of lineage. Let's read together verses 7 through 9. Not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise, at this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. This is a remarkable statement. This picks up from the story in Genesis chapter 17. I want you to turn there. We need to remind ourselves of what is going on here. Abraham, of course, is the man in Genesis chapter 12 called out by God's grace to be an inheritor of grace, an inheritor of promise, and a father of many nations. And through Abraham, of course, would come the blessings, not only to him and to his descendants, but eventually to all the peoples of the earth. And God promised that Abraham would have a son. Listen to Genesis 17. 19 to 21, God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him, and I will make him fruitful, and I will multiply him exceedingly, He shall become the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. Who is Isaac and who is Ishmael? Remember that Ishmael is Abraham's son. Ishmael is Abraham's firstborn son. But Abraham was not the son of Sarah, but of her handmaiden. And Abraham had taken matters into his own hands when it seemed like perhaps the promise of God might be delayed. And God makes his promise sure. That he would fulfill what he promised he would do. And he would fulfill this promise through Sarah, Abraham's wife. You know that Abraham and Sarah had aged out, as it were, (laughs) parenting. And yet God was kind And and the promise would come by miraculous intervention, by the supernatural work of God, and not by the hands of men. There's a reason that this gracious choice of God is on display here. This marks out God's initiating work through and through, for His keeping of His promises will not have something to do with man's initiative, nor man's abilities but all of God's work. If you're still in Genesis, turn over to Genesis chapter 21. After Isaac is born, there becomes some family difficulty. This blended family produced some animosities. In Genesis 21, 12, God says to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her. For through Isaac, 
your descendants shall be named. This is God's comfort to Abraham and his keeping of his promise that the covenant would come through Isaac. Now, Abraham cared for Ishmael. He even pleaded on behalf of Ishmael before God, and God promised that he would bless Ishmael. But his covenant promises would come through Isaac, just as God said. And so when Ishmael was cast out in Genesis 21, 12, God reiterates this promise that the covenant would come through Isaac. And this is exactly what Paul quotes here in Romans chapter 9. In Romans 9, 7, Paul quotes Genesis 21, 12. When Ishmael is being cast out, he reaffirms his promise to Abraham about Isaac, that through Isaac, your descendants will be named. Now think about that. Abraham has descendants. <laughs> Abraham has descendants through Ishmael and through the sons of Keturah as well. And yet, the naming here of descendants is a naming of God's covenant promise. That is God's selection, God's kindness, God's grace placed on a particular descent, a particular line. And that was to be the line of Isaac. Not all of Abraham's physical children were considered the children of God's promise, but the line of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Again, the idea here is not that Israel, not all Israel is Israel. It's not that Israel gets replaced by somebody else. It's that a select group within Israel is selected out by God for His grace to be recipients of promise. The children here are to be regarded as children of promise in this verse. They also happen to be children of the flesh, children according to physical descent from Abraham. But they are all examples of a subset relationship. Those physical descendants of Abraham who are also promissories of God's grace. And notice that this is not a promise that Isaac had to believe in order to be born, right? That should go without saying. Did, did Isaac have to grasp this truth prior to being born in order to be born as the child of promise? No, this took place before he was born. This promise was made before he was conceived. The promise was reiterated before he was born. And after he was born, this promise was reinstated. And remember that Isaac's birth was miraculous. Abraham and Sarah could not bear children, and they did by God's supernatural intervention. And Romans 9.9 9 says this, this is the word of promise. At this time, I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Again and again, God is reiterating his promise, that the promise that he made is the promise that he will keep. In Genesis 18, verse 10, we see the next appeal that Paul makes from the Old Testament. It is said to Abraham, I will surely return to you at this time next year, and behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And you remember this scene, Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced and aged. Sarah was past childbearing. Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I've become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And Yahweh said to Abram, why did Sarah laugh saying, shall I indeed bear a child when I'm so old? Is anything too difficult for Yahweh? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And Paul here quotes from verse 10 and verse 14 of Genesis 18 to reiterate this statement that God promised and God keeps his promise. And God's promises accomplish what human effort could never bring about. The bottom line is that God graciously selected Isaac not Ishmael. And this gracious selection demonstrates that God is not obligated to be gracious on the basis of family lineage. 
Ishmael was Abram's first. In fact, Ishmael was probably Abraham's favorite for a time. Abraham pleaded with God that God would see Ishmael as the promised one. And yet that was not God's plan. God wanted to put his own grace and glory on display by providing an impossible solution, a miraculous provision. And here's the reality. If blessing from God or if salvation from God depended on our best efforts, we would be forever hopeless. The selection of Isaac over Ishmael demonstrates just that. It does not depend on human effort but depends solely on God's kindness, His mercy, His grace. The second example that Paul gives from the Old Testament is this. God's gracious selection of Jacob demonstrates that God is not obligated to save on the basis of lineage, privilege, or performance. God's gracious selection of Jacob demonstrates that God is not obligated to save on the basis of lineage, privilege, or performance. And you think about this line, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Three men who did not deserve to know God or be known by God or have a relationship with God, selected out by grace, contrary to their natural dispositions, contrary to their natural bent. God was kind to each of them. Here's the second example, and it's in the third iteration, the third generation, God's gracious selection of Jacob. Paul picks it up in verse 10. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also. When she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, for though the twins were not yet born and had not yet done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Paul begins this section by saying, and not only this, but. In other words, he's going to take the case he just made with Abraham and Isaac another step further with Isaac and Jacob. The second example is even more striking. In the case of Isaac and Ishmael, one could point out the fact that there were two different mothers, that one child was born with uh, sort of Abraham taking matters into his own hands, and the other child was born miraculously and of promise, and so you could see a distinction between Ishmael and Isaac. And, and if you were to trace out their lives, you, you sort of see a totally different trajectories and paths between these two. But the second example is remarkable. They have the same mother. In fact, they have the same pregnancy. They were twins. They were in the same womb at the same time, and God made a choice. Again, God is demonstrating that his gracious choice is not, ba not made on the basis of family lineage. Both Esau and Jacob could claim family lineage. They could both say, we have Abraham as a grandfather. They could both say, we have Isaac as a father. We're in. Both could make the claim of riding the family coattails into the heritage of God's privileged possession. And yet God makes a gracious choice, not on the basis of family lineage, nor is this made on the basis of privilege. Notice, this is contrary to the ancient Near Eastern preference for primogeniture or the firstborn status. Whoever's born first gets the inheritance, the, the greatest portion. Whoever's born first gets the greatest responsibility. Whoever's born first gets the, take the place of his father and the, all the responsibilities of the family. That was the normal way of things. But notice what's said here, the older shall serve the younger. The main idea of this whole section in uh, 10 through uh, 13 is, 
is down there in verse 12. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. Everything else is supporting this idea. Rebecca also, when she had conceived twins by one man, though the twins were not yet born and had done nothing good or bad so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. The firstborn status is turned upside down. This is contrary to natural privilege, contrary to the rights of the firstborn, as it would have been seen in the ancient Near East, contrary to cultural expectation, contrary even to the desires of the father. You remember that dad had a favorite, and it was not the one God selected by grace. These two sons, Jacob and Esau, their destinies are played out in the history of two nations. Jacob, of course, gets renamed Israel, and the nation of Israel comes from him. And Esau becomes the nation Edom, and all of his descendants are the Edomites. And you can read in Numbers 24 or in Isaiah chapter 11, the unfolding history of God's dealings with the Edomites. It becomes very clear throughout biblical history that exactly what God said here would in fact take place, that the sons of Esau would in fact serve the sons of Israel. This was in keeping with God's promise, God's gracious choice to set his affections and covenant promises on Jacob and not on Esau. God demonstrates that his grace is not obligated, it is not given on the basis of lineage nor of privilege. And it is also not given on the basis of performance. Notice verse 11. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad. This is a critical statement for us to understand. God did not base his decision on the performance of the people he would set his affections on. It's been said by some that that God must look down the corridors of time and see those who will love him well, and those are the ones he sets his love on. Or God looks down the corridors of time and he sees those who will choose him, and those are the ones he chooses. Or God looks down the corridors of time and sees those who will believe in him, and those are the ones he chooses to be born again. And this is not the testimony of Scripture. In fact, such a reading of this text would turn Paul's argument completely upside down. For the very demonstration of the integrity of God's word is the demonstration of God's initiating grace that is not predicated on the performance of individuals. It's not predicated on some idea that God would see in the future what they would do and then respond You see, there's nothing that man could ever produce, no effort that man could ever put forward, no natural inclination that man could ever have that is somehow Godward that would please the Lord to provoke a response from the Lord to love us. The Bible's description of salvation is just the opposite of that. We in our unloveliness, we in our enemy status, We, in our antagonism against God, we're in a hopeless, helpless state where we could do nothing to please Him. In fact, anything good in us is not the cause of grace, but is the effect of grace. And if we get this backwards, if we make things good in us the cause of grace, then as we'll find out later in the book of Romans, grace is no longer grace. You undefine grace when you make grace an obligation, right? When someone is obligated to do something for you in return for what you have done, it's not grace. It's not a gift. It is what is owed. However, God saves by grace. His own free love. That love is not obligated or constrained by anything outside of itself. It's certainly not the performance of people like Jacob and Esau. (laughs) 
But we read their history. And, and of themselves, these, these guys are terrible. They're fighting in the womb. They're at odds with each, with each other throughout their lives. Esau wants to kill his brother. Esau forsakes his birthright. Jacob connives him out of it. And neither one of them is an upstanding young man that is deserving of God's love or his kindness. God's kindness comes to one in spite of sin and then produces a Godward life that only grace could produce. And the trajectories of the two men, Jacob and Esau, go their different directions. And their descent lines go their different directions as well. Think about Jacob's life. Were it not for grace, he would have been no better than his brother. That's a fundamental distinction between the two states of humanity. Those saved by grace and those still in their natural condition the only difference between the two is God's kindness, God's initiating love, God's free choice, His gracious selection. If God demonstrates that His grace is not given on the basis of lineage or privilege, nor of performance, on what basis does this grace come? To, to state this positively, we look at the second half of verse 11. So that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. This is stated positively two different ways. First of all, God's purpose, according to choice. Why does grace come to a sinner? Because of God's purpose, according to the standard of his own choice. Now, there's something in us that wants to get behind that a little bit, don't we? Well, what is the basis for God's choice? Well, what is that standard? I need to know. We don't get to know those things. What we are told is that God's choice is predicated based on His choice. It's found only in Him. It's, it's found in the purposes according to the standard of his choice, and those things must stand. In fact, the reason God saves the way he saves, before either of these two brothers was born, one was selected in the kindness of God to be a purveyor of God's promises, to, to, to be a benefactor of God's blessings. And the reason God does it that way is so that His glorious purposes stand. There is a no boasting clause in the New Testament. <laughs> the no boasting clause of grace. This is the agreement we come in on. Listen, if you're going to be saved from your sin by God, it means you will never boast in yourself. God won't have it any other way. This whole section culminates in the end of Romans 11 that from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. I think first in Paul's mind is God's plan of salvation as he utters that doxological refrain. That God's going to save people who will not say, oh, I have Abraham as my father. I'm of the line. I had all of the privileges at my disposal. I was in the right nation. I had the right books. I did the right things. God will have none of that. <laughs> but he will have his purpose according to his choice stand. And this is a magnification of his own glory and of his grace. The second way this is stated positively is at the end of verse 11. Not because of works, but because of him who calls. Again, this is God's effectual calling of sinners unto salvation. This is the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit whereby a person is transformed. The moment where you were thinking before that the things of God were boring and now they're thrilling to you. When one moment you were spiritually dead and all of a sudden you're spiritually alive. When you didn't 
care to think about sin or you just revel in sin and all of a sudden, I, I hate sin and I'm sorry for my sin. I need forgiveness of sin and Christ is my Savior. That, that moment when spiritual death gives way to spiritual life, that is the effectual call of God and it happens in a moment. It's supernatural work by His Holy Spirit. And it is because of him who does this calling that anybody is saved. Not because of your lineage, not because of any privilege, and certainly not because of your performance, but only because of him who does this kind of calling, who makes dead men live, who produces life where there was none. And notice how this love, this grace is described in verse 13. It's described with an Old Testament quotation, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Jacob I loved, and Esau I hated. The, these two words, love and hate, are, are polar opposites. They, they describe two totally different realities. Two sets of activities born out of affections. This is a a difficult phrase. This is a quote from Malachi, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. I want you to turn there. This is somewhat jarring if we've grown accustomed to a sort of shallow notion of the love of God. Right? We hear this said often enough, God is love, God is love, God is love. And, And that is a biblical truth. But it certainly is not a biblical truth that excludes all other attributes of God. It certainly is not a biblical truth that erases other things that God wishes to communicate. And it's important for us to understand what the love of God is and on whom it is bestowed. God certainly is love, and any of us who have experienced the love of God in Christ Jesus would say no other. How could a God as holy and perfect as he who cannot tolerate sin love someone like me? We will forever be amazed at his love. And we have the contrast of God's affectionate love for his people set against another affection. And here's the prophet Malachi, beginning of verse 1 of Malachi 1. (coughs) The oracle of the word of Yahweh to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says Yahweh, but you say, how have you loved us? What an arrogant question. For the objects of God's love to say, I don't see it, God. I don't see how you've loved me. I want you to think about the setting that Malachi is writing. Malachi is a post-exilic prophet. That is, he's writing to the nation of Israel after they have been taken away into Babylonian and Assyrian exile, and then piecemeal been brought back to the land. They're not a nation whole, united as they were before. They've got a ramshackle temple that's sort of been thrown together. They don't have a Davidic king sitting over them, as God has promised. They are not in the glory days of David and Solomon in the United Kingdom, and they're not in the future kingdom days that have been prophesied in a restoration. They're in something of dire straits. They're under the thumb of foreign governments. They're really at the mercy of whatever government is in vogue of the day. They're not experiencing the peace and prosperity that has been promised from God. And God says, I have loved you, Israel. And Israel says, how have you loved us? We don't feel a lot of love right now. And God says, was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares Yahweh? Yet I have loved Jacob but I have hated Esau. What does God mean by this in Malachi? He begins to unfold the divergence between these two nations, these two twins uh, 
who were nations in their mother's womb. And God unfolds what he has done with Esau or the Edomites. Verse 3, I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Though Edom says, we've been beaten down, but we will return and build up the ruins. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, they may build, but I will tear down. Men will call them the wicked territory and the people toward whom the Yahweh is indignant forever. Your eyes will see this and you will say, Yahweh be magnified beyond the border of Israel. What is Malachi saying? Malachi is putting on display a contrast. God has set his unswerving affections on Israel. And he has made promises that he will keep. And even though they're in difficult times at the time that Malachi is writing, God is faithful to his promises. Paul is appealing to this very reality in Romans and simply pointing out that God will keep his promises to Israel. He has set his affections on her. And that is different than what he has done with other nations, specifically the nation of Esau. And it, it's not helpful to try to soften this word hatred. Some commentators have said, have rewritten this verse to say, Jacob I loved and Esau I loved a little less. <laughs> That's not the idea. Uh, for God to tear down his fortresses and, and make his habitation a waste place is the pouring out of God's judgment, the pouring out of God's anger. And listen, God being angry with sinners is nothing new in the New Testament. Uh, the whole idea of anger and hatred and wrath are not new. Consider Psalm 5.5. 5. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. Jesus said in John chapter 3 that he who believes in the Son has eternal life. But the one who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Ephesians 2 tells us that we all were children of wrath. We were all under this same anger, this same hatred that God has for the wicked on a daily basis, the same hatred he describes of Jacob. Nahum 1-2 says this, a jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Paul said in Romans 1, the wrath of God is being revealed against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. There's no use simply saying, it's not true, it's not true, I know God is love, I know God is love, he's not really angry with me. He's not really angry with people. He doesn't really hate Jacob. It doesn't help to rewrite this verse or, or say it's not there or, or make it say something it doesn't say any more than someone who's diagnosed with a mortal physical ailment should say, I'm not sick. What one should do if one finds oneself under the wrath of God is to turn to that same God who loves to be merciful to those who will turn to him in faith. That's where Romans 9 is headed Turn to the remedy and discover the love of God. <laughs> you hear people say from time to time, I would never believe in a God who hated Jacob. I would never believe in a God who would send people to hell. Well, you better, because he does. And if you turn to him in faith and experience his love, you will escape the wrath that is coming. This is God's gracious invitation. A woman once said to Mr. Spurgeon, I cannot understand why God should say that he hated Esau. That, Spurgeon replied, is not my difficulty, madam. My trouble is to understand how God could love Jacob. And that's right. How could God love the likes of me? When his love is free, unobligated, and given to whom he chooses... Election is by grace, not by deserts. Listen, if, if we got what we deserved, we would all be in trouble. But that God would be gracious and set his love on any who would believe, this is the way salvation has always worked. 
Listen, no one will be able to stand before God and say, but my parents were Christians. You know, I had some really great Next Generation Ministries teachers. You know, I went to a church where the word of God was faithfully proclaimed. No one will be able to stand before God and claim any works, any good deeds as a basis of salvation. You can never stand before God and, and hold up your lineage or your privilege or your performance. Listen, only grace saves. Only the grace of God. And listen, God's people are secure and God's promises are secure because God initiates. Because God selects of his own free choice those whom he will set his affections on. No one can undo that work. You can't unperform that work. And it means that no matter your background, no matter your lineage, no matter your privilege or lack thereof, no matter how much sin you've committed up to this point in your life, grace is available if you will only but believe the gospel. That Jesus the Christ came to a cross and died in the place of sinners, that anyone who would believe would have all of their sins taken away forever. Every sin, past, present, and future, wiped clean by the grace of God. Has God's word failed? No, God's word has not failed. The first thing we must realize is that not everyone that can claim lineage is a recipient of God's saving grace. Not all physical Israel is spiritual Israel. This is the grace of election. This is the way God has always worked, that God would choose some in his kindness. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, that doesn't quite sound fair, because if God chooses some, does that mean he chooses not to choose others? And Paul knew you would ask that question, and that's what he's going to dive into next week, and you can read ahead if you'd like. I put on the web outline some resources for further study in Romans 9 to 11, really in two categories, and I added a couple more this week. On the doctrine of election, um, I, I would recommend to you J.I. Packer's Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, Steele and Thomas's The Five Points of Calvinism, Martin Luther's The Bondage of the Will, and Ian Murray's Spurgeon versus Hypercalvinism. On the future of Israel, a book by Michael Vlock called Has the Church Replaced Israel?, uh, Israel and the Church by Ronald DeProse, Matt Wehmeyer's book, Amillennialism and the Age to Come, and John Piper's The Justification of God. Uh, the, our deacons at the book table, Omri and Jeff, uh, would love to help you find those resources. If you want to uh, find the best price on those things, talk to those guys. And if you would like more uh, information on uh, these doctrines and how they unfold, those, those would be good recommendations to read further. Let me close in prayer. God, thank you for today. Thank you for the reminder that you save by grace. That this whole idea of election, which cuts at our self-esteem, which, which cuts out from under us any pretension of merit, which humbles us below your grace and your love, is so good for us. It's so good for us to, to be humbled and to be small before you and to remember that we deserve nothing but your wrath and that we were running opposite from you. We were running away from you in our sin. We were actively suppressing the truth before you were kind to open our eyes and that we are recipients of your love and beneficiaries of eternal kindness only because you initiated and set your affections on us who don't deserve it. It is your immeasurable grace that we praise. In Jesus' name, amen.